Hi, I'm Mitch Gallagher from Sweetwater, and I'm coming to you from a very cool location. I'm at the Cutting Room Club in New York City. We have a very special guest with us today, Anton Figgis here. It's great to see you. Yeah, great to see you as well. I've Appreciate seen you a lot of times on, oh, thank you. on the videos. Yeah. I've seen you a lot of times too. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so man, I, I, as I was thinking about this interview with you, I'm like, where do we possibly start? I mean, the, the career you've had, the experiences you've had, the, the opportunities and the, the artists you've worked with and things, it's just, just amazing. How do you view it from your vantage point now, looking back on your career? I mean, I listened to a lot of different kinds of music when I was growing up <clears throat> in South Africa. Mm -hmm. So when I got here, <clears throat> I was in, you know, I was very interested in lots of different kinds of music and that's sort of what ended up being good for Letterman because that's what you had to do. Sure. But the way that New York was when I got here, um, there was a lot of playing in the clubs, there was a lot of playing in the studios, there was a lot of interaction. And that has changed somewhat now. I think mostly due to COVID, mm -hmm. but um, or for whatever other reasons, New York became more <clears throat> gentrified in that the big corporations bought out blocks. And so all the little character shops, mom and pop shops got taken away and there was a whatever big corporate thing in its place. And so the city kind of got more homogenized than it was like New York was the center of the universe, for like in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, sure. 90s even, you know, and then it sort of moved away from there. So I think I was lucky to, to be in New York at the time when it was a really vibrant city. Mm -hmm. And I think that helped a lot. Yeah, there was so much going on in those yeah. days. And you certainly came in prepared because in South Africa, you were playing in a lot of different bands and making music there. But then sure. you got a degree from the New England Conservatory of Music in right. jazz and classical. Right. Well, so I in South Africa, I thought like all the, you know, great, there was all this great indigenous music there. You know, the, the, like the stuff like what Paul Simon did on Graceland, the backing stuff, that mm -hmm. kind of music. There was a lot of that stuff, which was fantastic. But, you know, in terms of jazz and rock, I, you know, we just lusted after America from the, that, you know, and that was in the days of no TV there. And of course, no internet, no videos, no nothing. So we, the only communication was via records, listening to records and some of them you couldn't get there and some of them got brought back by people. So we all wanted to come over to America and like, you know, I wanted to see, wanted to hear these guys live and see if I could play with any of them. Yeah. So. And, and that worked out. So my parents said, well, if I, come, if I get a degree, they'll kind of endorse it, you know, and help me. Mm -hmm. So I went to, I got into New England Conservatory and they had a classical and jazz department. And I applied for the jazz department. For some reason, they accepted me into the classical, which mm -hmm. I still can't understand. So when I got, I, I got there, I sort of did both degrees at the same time. And at the end, they said, you can have whichever one you want because mm -hmm. you've sort of got the credit. So I said, I'll take the classical. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so that was it. But I got to play in the orchestra, you know, Stravinsky and all that, Timps, and that was fabulous. And then I played with Jackie Biden, his big band, George Russell in his big band. It was just a really exciting time. And then at nights, you know, the student bands, we'd go out and play. And there were some fabulous musicians there, like Roger Rosenberg is a fantastic baritone player. Alan Pasqua, who's a fantastic keyboard player who I took to South Africa with me to play in a reunion concert with my band. Nice. And, um, and George Russell actually was doing a concert in, in New York and Tony Williams was the drummer. It was a big band concert. Tony couldn't do the rehearsal and I knew the material because I'd been doing it in Boston with him in the band, in, the, in college. So he invited me to play in the rehearsals. And I played the rehearsals and then he said, OK, well, you can play in the band. I'll put you in with the band and Tony will be center stage. I go, great. So I'm about to go on stage. And by the way, it's Carnegie Hall. Oh, nice. I forgot to mention, <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is my first gig no in New York. Carnegie Hall with Tony Williams. <laughs> well, what could go wrong? Yeah, right. You know, um, certainly can't get any better. Right. You know, the bar was set. So um, as I was about to go on stage, this guy, the union guy comes up and says, do you have a union card? And I thought, oh, you know, no, and I'm a student in Boston. Right at that point, somebody 
so he calls him, hey, so-and-so, whatever his name was. And he turned around, and as he turned around, I just ran off off. stage. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. You think about it, it's little things like that that happen. That is, it's like a fine line that can make or... So there's a lot of good things like that that have happened to me. I don't know about all the bad ones that could have happened to me. Right. And even better ones that might have had it gone in a different direction. But there's all these funny little cracks in, yeah. in reality or something yeah. that just make things happen. All those forks in the road that could, yeah. go, could go either direction. Right, exactly. Right. Well, that's awesome. So anyway, I was, did the gig. And in the middle of the gig, it comes to a section of like four bars of band, four bars of drums. And Tony turns around and says, take it. So I start having to trade with Tony Williams, which, you know, sounds glamorous, but it's a nightmare <laughs> you know, for me. Because, like, you know, in, uh, in South Africa, the, the, the bathwater goes down an opposite way to America. But anyway, it doesn't matter which way it goes around. Playing with him in his vortex, I felt like I was just going down the drain. <laughs> <laughs> it was just like, this is too much, you know. Well, that's amazing. So I was completely, you know, it was just fantastic to... And, and it ended up, I got to play with Tony Williams three times <laughs> because he came on the Letterman show a couple times. And, and there I got to trade with them as well. This was much, many years later. And the only bad thing about that was that the cameraman, who must, must have not known too much about music, he was filming the guy who wasn't doing the four. So there's a lot of shots of me like this, <laughs> like this. And, and then Tony's like, you know. <laughs> so <clears throat> that was that instance. Right. So it was Tony listens. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. He's, yeah, right. So, you know, he had it wrong. Anyway, at that, po at that time, I said I was going to South Africa. And so Tony said, look, if you can't do the show, I'll sub for you, which I just thought was amazing. And not that, and I'm not in any way comparing us. It just would have been great to see Tony Williams on the letter. Oh, yeah. I mean, he's the one guy that I looked up to more than anybody. And in no shape or way or form do I put myself anywhere close. Right. To it. It's so obvious. Anyway, wow. so I, and I have a pair of his sticks from that day. Great, all chopped up and everything. <laughs> but so I asked Paul, I said, Tony, you know, Tony said he would play the show. So, so Paul said, great, you know, and called him. And then that was right at the time when he went into hospital mm. for his gallbladder and passed away. Mm. So, I mean, I would have loved to hear him on the show. That would have been fantastic. Yeah. Uh, Willie's comment about him was he's very flammable, you know? Because <laughs> right. he didn't need much and he would just <laughs> take explode off, yeah. and take off. You right. Know? Yeah. Right. And so I, I would imagine that having the formal training, if you will, from the conservatory, being able to read had to be a powerful calling card for you as you moved into the studio world and doing yeah. some of the things that you were doing when you arrived here in New York. Yeah, there's a lot of good, fantastic drummers that don't read. And you don't have to be able to read. Mm -hmm. But for certain gigs, um, it's required. Mm -hmm. Like, especially if you would, when I used to do a lot of jingles and stuff in the studios in the morning, all the musicians did. And then they'd go and, you know, play at the clubs at night. Uh, there's just not time to memorize it because mm -hmm. you're just coming in and you've got to kind of be playing it within the first, second time. Right. So that definitely helped. And, you know, uh, I think that um, it's hard to quantify how the formal training helped, but I know it helped. It broadened my whole sense of music, mm -hmm. whether it be harmony or composition or whatever. It's, it's just lovely to hear these beautiful, I mean, I was really into Stravinsky then, I still am, uh, just these beautiful compositions, yeah. and, and then get to play some of them. You know, some of it was hard. Yeah, oh yeah. You know, the Rite of Spring timpani part is quite hard. I remember Vic Firth was my teacher <laughs> at the conservatory, and the guy <clears throat> that preceded me at the conservatory was Harvey Mason. Wow. He was a few years before me. How about that? Yeah. And so Vic, and I remember Vic showing me the Rite of Spring stuff. Now, <clears throat> What's happened to classical music now is it's so much harder than, you know, that was considered hard in my mm -hmm. time there, that which was, you know, a long time ago. But now I think what is required of people and also what people can do these days is a, it's almost like a different instrument and a diff definitely a different level. Yeah, the complexity of the rhythmic things is... is yeah, what in, people in do world, now, so. I mean, I hear guys playing, I just can't believe it. Yeah. 
It's like not the same instrument. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Fantastic stuff. Yeah. So I, I have to jump ahead just a little bit because uh, uh, your solo album from 2002, Figments. Yeah. Uh, I have to ask you about two things on that. On that okay. Record. One is working with Brian Wilson. Yep. And the other one is Richie Havens. Yeah. I mean, the whole album is loaded up with yeah. special guests and amazing yeah. players. And, yeah. But the, the contributions of those two obviously are, are so immediately recognizable. Right. And I'm curious of your memories of working with those two Yeah. Artists, so, two artists. you know, that record was released a uh, Maybe twenty years ago, but it still sounds great to me still today. Still sounds fresh, yeah. And it was, it was, it was also right before stuff started to sell on the internet. It was right at the cusp of that. People weren't used to just buying on the internet. And also, it was a record that had a whole lot of people, which also wasn't that much done. Mm -hmm. Became very popular, so I felt like it was, you know, a, a good contribution. All these people that are on the record are people that I played with. Mm -hmm. I didn't kind of cold call anyone, although I hadn't played with Brian, but. With him, uh, Blondie Chaplin's a really good friend of mine, and, and who does play with Brian now, mm -hmm. played with the Stones for years, and who I knew in South Africa, he was in The Flames, a band called The Flames. Anyway, he had sung Sail on Sailor, he was the lead voice on that. So he sort of knew Brian. And I didn't get to Brian through him, I got to him through uh, David Leaf. But anyway, I thought to put Brian and Blondie on the same track would be great. and. Blondie and I had written this track together. And um, I spoke to David Leaf and eventually he got to Brian for me and Brian said he would do it. And he came and we did it in the studio where they remastered Pet Sounds. And they actually showed me the tapes of God Only Knows and stuff like wow. that, which is amazing. And so Brian said to me, okay, so sing me what you want me to do. And I'm going, Oh my God, I can't, I'm, I can't sing to Brian what I want. But anyway, <laughs> I, I was, I sang like the line and he would, he did the line and, and then there was a counter line and he triple tracked it. And then there these big R's in the chorus and I sang him the top line and he did that. And then he said, you want four or five part harmony underneath that? And I, I didn't want to be greedy. I thought, like, you know, the guys, are, I said, okay, four by, you know. And so he just sang the top line and then he sang, and he just built it, stacked it. And right in the middle is one part where it crisscrosses and makes that like very distinctive Brian Wilson sound. Yeah. It was just so unbelievable. So on my record, at the end of the record, I put it by itself because mm -hmm. it's so beautiful. So it's like a deep cut right at the very end of the, after the record ends. But it was amazing. But <clears throat> he did say to me, um, I think John and Paul are watching us. <laughs> <laughs> Which struck me, uh, you know, and he was very nice. He said, I like working with you. Right. I thought, well, like, wow, great. that was great. Nice and I went back to Blondie's house after that. And it was out in California. And it was a fabulous experience. It had to be. It had yeah. to be. Yeah. And then you had Richie Havens as well. And, okay, he, so he's, Richie, he's so distinctive. I'd played with Richie. I'd done some gigs with him. Mm -hmm. I called him up. I sent him the song. So he said, sure, I'll do it. So we, we recorded his vocals in my apartment in the city. I hired like a C12 microphone and it was in the bedroom, which was, you know, seemed like it had a good vocal sound. And there's a knock on the door and he comes in, he's like Richie with his jewelry and everything. It's just clanking everywhere. <laughs> Got his guitar and his everything. And he sits down in the bedroom, you know, where, where the mic is. And he sang the song, he knew it. And he sang it beautifully. We were recording on Pro Tools, you know, mm -hmm. and that was it, you know. It was, right. I was just like, wow, it's Richie Havens. Right. You know? right. So Fantastic. distinctive. Yeah. It was beautiful. Yeah, well, I, I recommend uh, everyone check out the album because there's yeah, so much I'm great really stuff. Yeah, I'm really proud of it. It's really yeah, a good record. Really cool like, is, is there another one coming? No, you know what? I'm toying around with a little bit of stuff, but it all yeah. comes down to the material. Sure. You know, I can get the players, I think, but it's the material. Right. Yeah. Right. That was fantastic. Yeah. So lately, you've been playing a lot with guitar players. Obviously, Joe Bonamassa is yeah. uh, looming large there, but yeah. also Osnoy and, and sure. some of the other players around. Right. Talk a little bit about working with guitar players as a drummer. Do you adjust to what they're doing? Do you set things up and they play on top of you? Or what's the relationship like when you come in with those powerful players well, like that? It depends on the band. Like with Joe, you know, I, I toured with him for six years and he toured constantly. So. You know, the band would be playing five nights a week and there would be a set. So, you know, there was definitely variations that you could do within the music, but it was the set and it was about 
how to kind of make the music move, make all the corners smooth and make the music just be solid and consistent so that he could do his thing over that. And then if he changed, or if he was doing something that was the same, that you knew was coming, you could kind of set it up and play with it mm -hmm. and complement it or do something against it or whatever. So that was with him. You know, with music like with us, it's, it's more, the solos are different every single time. Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of following what he does and supporting that, but at the same time, you know, it's usually in like a trio situation. So every instrument is, is a force that's intertwining. So you support it and give them something to sit comfortably on or get pushed by, but you've got to react to what they do. Mm -hmm. I just did a gig with Oz and um, Jimmy Haslip and Mike Stern. Right. And Mike, Mike is a very rhythmic player. His time is, is, is fantastic. Mm -hmm. So like when, you, when I play with him, the few times I do, it's like so great because I just kind of sit on his time. It's just so solid. And then he does the Mike Stern show, you know, which is fantastic. Sure, of course. Yeah. Right, right. It's great. So everybody's different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you just make adjustments for them. Right. The guitar player is one thing. The bass player is, is the one that drummers typically are really locking with. Right. Can you talk a little bit about that, how you perceive what the bass player is doing and how it affects what you're doing right. as a drummer? Well, again, it depends on the music because there's some music that where the bass drum and the bass kind of are very similar, mm -hmm. you know? And so you, so you want to be on the same patterns with them. Like say with Joe, that would be the kind of music where there was more of the same kind of stuff. <clears throat> but that was with Michael Rhodes, who's a great bass player. And then you can stray a bit from that. When it's in the power trio, when it's like say Will playing with Oz or Jimmy Haslip or something, it's, um, it's three people, like more like, you know, cream. Mm -hmm. Doesn't sound anything like it, but you know, those were three people doing their thing, but doing it together. So then you kind of playing as three different instruments. Right. Same thing. So I think it depends a lot on the music. But you know, if you if the bass drum if the drum and the bass player are locked, it obviously gives a bigger underpinning to all the music. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. Right. Right. Do you? I mean, you don't want to just be doing your own thing, obviously. Sure. It's got to be. Too I guess that was that was my next question. Do you find that you as as a drummer? Uh, alter your playing or conform your playing to what they're doing? Or do you set the groove and then they conform more to you? How do you, how do you prefer for that to be? I think I conform to them. Uh-huh. Yeah. Right. I think they set the tone and then I try and find a way to fit into that and then, and then make it my own, but within their framework. Which has to make that one of the reasons why you were such a, well, are so in demand as a player live and in the studio as well, because in the studio you're working with an artist right. and, and adding your parts to that. Right. Do you tend to go in with an idea of where you think things are going to go? So you're, are you, how prepared are you going in when an artist calls you or, or is looking to work with you? I'm prepared in as much as if I've got the material beforehand that I know it. Mm -hmm. Often you don't have the material beforehand. Um, but I've played with so many artists like on Letterman, say so that's not like recording in the studio where it was playing with the people for the first time. Mm -hmm. And I, I vividly remember in so many situations, starting to play with people and then watching them just relax. And like they kind of knew like, okay, they, I, can I can rely on this. You know, it happened within like, within half a song or like even less, you know, a few mm -hmm. bars. So that's why it's good to lock into them because they're the artist. Right. You know? Um, in recording, um, I think, you know, you try and make it right for the song. And then it's a matter of knowing how much to play. I mean, you always got to serve the song. And then sometimes you think, well, they've hired you. You've got to do a little bit more. But, you know, sometimes you can't. Sometimes mm -hmm. the song demands that you do very, very little. Right. And, you know, so, you know, I've lis I listen back to stuff and go, I hear a spot go, I wish I'd done something there. Or I go, I wish I hadn't had done something there. Sure. You know. Right. Yeah. In hindsight, you can always always hear those. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, glaringly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
So you have to be one of the most visible drummers of, of all time with the, the Letterman uh, experience for 30 years, right? You were doing yeah, 29. 29, yeah, was, yeah, nearly 30. Yeah. And, but also events like Live Aid. Right. Had to be a, an amazing experience amazing. to get up in front of everyone in the world. Basically. Amazing, yeah. That was, we I played with the Thompson Twins and it was Nile Rodgers and Madonna sat in on a song and the Thompson Twins, also Felicia was on guitar, Will was on bass and Philippe Sace on keyboards and just, you know, it was for a fabulous, fantastic cause. Mm -hmm. But playing at, uh, well, I think it was 120,000 people and all those bands, um, it was unbelievable. Right. It was, I mean, it was right before I joined Letterman. Uh -huh. Right before that. So I was still kind of, you know, I was in the New York scene for sure. Mm -hmm. And I'd done some stuff with Nile. I'd done the Mick Jagger, he, he did the so She's the Boss record. Okay. And so I did a few songs on that record. Right. So, I'd, and I'd done some other stuff with him as well. Right. right. Yeah. So one of the things that had to make you perfect for the Letterman gig, as well as some, so many of these other things, is your ability to, to morph through different styles and to right. instantly jump into, also just to absorb the songs so quickly and be able to sit down right. and play it. Can you talk a little bit about how your mind works? How do you think your way through those kinds of things? Well, I mean, in terms of knowing the, the, all the different stuff, you know, I'd, you know, I'd like played with, say, Ace, so I, I knew like the more heavy stuff. And I'd done jazz and a lot of jazz in Boston. That's all I was into for five years. So I knew a lot of the nuances of that. And, um, you know, I grew up as a rock drummer, so I knew a lot of that stuff. So, but all the music together, I always felt if you have a good feel, there's some language that is associated with each style. And you know, some of those things you can make, you can get by mm -hmm. very, very easily. So I always strive to get a good feel first and then be able to have some of the language of the actual style to throw in as well. Right. And that's the way that it worked. And I don't know why I could do it quickly, but I, I just was able to right. get the songs for us. The way your head works. Yeah. Right, right. Because uh, I can't remember people's names or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> or what I have for lunch. Yeah. Right, right, right. So I've seen two, two quotes about you, uh, one from you and one from, from someone else who I'm drawing, I'm sorry I'm drawing a blank, but the quote from someone else was that Anton has the groove, but he mixes that with the jazz vocabulary. Mm -hmm. Is that the way you think of it? Yeah, I, and I think that was one of the reasons that I got going in the rock scene in New York was because I was a rock drummer, but I had... I'd done, you know, I, I did only jazz in Boston. So when I came back to New York, I saw everyone was going, got it back to your roots. And my roots were rock, rock. That's what I grew up on. English invasion and all that. So, but I now knew this other language and I could not just be basic meat and potatoes. I could throw a whole lot of stuff in. Stuff that people know, all know now, but in those then, you know, it wasn't so much. Right. And I think, plus, I think I'm, a, I'm an improvising musician. I like to improvise. I like to throw in stuff. And often it's a little unexpected. And, uh, but that's the way that I like to play. I like to interact. I like to have a, a conversation with people when I'm playing with them. And so that's what I try to do. But right. in a, with a rock backbeat. Right, you know. right, right. So cool. Yeah. So the other quote is from you, and you have said, uh, actually a number of times, that your philosophy is that all music is related. Yeah. Do you really see it all as one thing? Well, it's one thing in, yes, I kind of do. It, it's one thing in terms of like, it's all grooves, you know what I mean? And the only thing that makes it different might be the scales or the rhythms or something or other, but it's all got that groove. The goal is to kind of reach you Mm -hmm. a certain way, the end result is people feel really good from the music that they listen to. But I mean, you know, that doesn't make all music the same, or it doesn't mean you have to like all music. But I found like I could embrace a lot of music because I sort of thought I felt a certain commonality between it all. Mm -hmm. Right, So. right, right, that's fascinating, yeah. that's fascinating. So when I have an artist like yourself uh, who has such a storied career and has done so many amazing things, I always have to ask one question, and that is, what makes a great artist? You know, I don't know. I don't, I don't know, but I remember I was backstage with Link Ray and Bruce Springsteen was there and he said, 
you know, if I can't, when I come and hear a band, if I can't get something f from it, from them, then I just leave. Which made me think, like everything comes from something before. So I think the great artists are the ones that have synthesized everything that came before it and then transformed it into their own way of saying it. Where you can't say, oh, that's from there and that's from there. They've completely made it their own. Mm -hmm. And so it sounds completely original. I mean, I, I like, you know, my, I loved Miles Davis and he changed music over and over again. But it didn't come from nowhere. You know what I mean? It, did, it came from somewhere, but somehow he was able to be in the time and just Maybe he wasn't ahead of his stuff. Maybe he was just completely in it and everyone else is behind it. Right. You know, right. and he was able to, but it sounded like he was ahead of his time. Sure. Because he thought of it before everyone else right. or felt it. Yeah. Right, right, right. Wonderful, wonderful. So two questions. Do you have advice for someone, a drummer coming up, wants to get gigs and get out and play and, and uh, have the sort of career like you had? Well, in terms of playing, Take a leak before you go on stage. <laughs> no. Number one priority. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be surprised. Yeah. <laughs> I think the, the, the thing is um, you have to relax. That's, I think, the biggest thing. Mm -hmm. Because A, it helps your playing a lot. And B, you know, the music, you want to keep the music going at, a, at an even pace. And if you're tense, you know, tension ruins all that stuff. And li listen, I'm totally, uh, I can do a full and go, and when I listen back, oh, geez, I sped up there. You know what I mean? But if I was totally relaxed all the time, I don't think that would happen less or not so visibly, mm -hmm. orally. I would say relax, and I would say that you have to trust yourself in what you do and play what you can do and don't play what you can't do. You know what I mean? We're all like wanting to play what, oh, what, that guy sounds amazing, he sounds amazing. I'm going, and I'll beat myself up over that. I've got to go, no, you've got to play what you can do. It's not to say you don't strive to do more stuff and learn how to do more stuff, because we keep want to grow all the time. But at some point, you know, especially after you've got a few miles behind you, you can say, I've done this for a while and it's sort of worked. Not to rest on your laurels, but just to have confidence in yourself. I guess it comes down to having confidence in yourself. Right, right, absolutely. Yeah. Well, we so appreciate you sitting down with us today. And, well, uh, thank you uh, for inviting me. So what do you have going on now? What's, uh, what's coming up for you? To be honest, uh, um, you know, the COVID thing stopped everything in its tracks and like I had a whole bunch of tours that got stopped in its tracks. I've done like a ton, I have stuff coming up, but I've done a ton of recordings at home. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, since you haven't asked me, and I appreciate it. Sweetwater did help me a whole lot. Oh, good. Yeah, I've been, uh, I bought a whole lot of gear there, and mostly, though, I have to say that I lucked into a couple of people there that were like tech help for me. Mm -hmm. So after I bought the gear, they, you know, really helped me, you know, when I'd have a problem. I'd call them up, they'd get back to me, and they'd really help me. And so I've got a really lovely system at home and I record a lot of stuff and people are very happy with the drum sounds and it's great and I do a lot of that stuff. Oh, great. So that really worked out. Right, so people are sending you tracks, you're playing on them. Yeah, I see, I see, right? so that's cool. Right, so. I'm well, actually, next week, I'm, it's funny, I'm going out to, before the Kiss Cruise, there with the Fraley's Comet people. I mean, I haven't done a, I don't do the Kiss conventions and that. This is maybe the second one in 30, 40 years. Right. But anyway, I'm going to go and play with uh, some of those guys. Oh, wow. So I have to relearn that material quickly. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah for those who, who don't know, you played yeah. on Ace, uh, Ace's first, uh, the solo album. The so, uh, a couple and, of Kiss records. Yeah, Dynasty and Unmasked. Right, and, uh, and, um, and a bunch of records with Ace after that. Yeah. So the Fraley's Comet records. Right. So they... They wanted us to play, so I thought, oh, oh, that's great. You know, what the hell? That's going to be fun. Yeah. yeah that's, that's awesome. Well, there's been, you know, it's funny with this being, because with Letterman and then I had Joe, I had about 34 years of constant, constant work. So now, like, I'm at home, I'm recording, I go out, I play dates, 
I just got to play with Jeff Loeb and, and Haslip, which was great. Nice, yeah. I never, never dreamt I'd actually do a gig like that. And Jimmy called me, and I did a bunch of gigs with them. It was really fun. Fantastic. I had to learn a ton of stuff for that. Right. It was great. Right. So I'm doing different, different stuff, you know. I'm kind of excited, and the main thing is, is that I feel like I'm improving. Mm -hmm. And that's the most important thing for me. Right. You know. All right, fantastic. Yeah. Well, my one big regret from our trip here to New York is last week was the gig with Mike Stern and Osno oh, and yeah. Maslip and you. And man, yeah. I would have loved to have seen oh, that. Oh, yeah, yeah, so yeah. I regret not seeing that. So I hope you guys will play again so I can get a chance to, yeah. to see you guys play. Yeah. That'd be fantastic. I hope so, yeah. Right. Such yeah. a pleasure to sit down with you. Thank you very really much. Really have enjoyed really nice uh, to talk to you. getting to meet you. Yeah. And uh, man, so much great music. Such an amazing career. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right. Okay. And thank you for joining us here at the Cutting Room in New York City. I'm with Anton Fig, Mitch Gallagher from Sweetwater.